Crime One and Chaos contains adult language and graphic content. Listener discretion is advised. Chin out and tits up, Chaos Kids. I'm <laughs> Naomi. What? I'm Amber, and this is Crime One and Chaos. <laughs> I'm doing it. Chin out and tits up. I mean, I mean, tits up. Haven't you ever watched The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel? No. Do you have Amazon Prime? Yeah, I don't watch. I don't watch things. You know. Oh, you know what? You're Ugh. missing out. Like okay. when I say, there's like all kinds of shows that are great that you can like not watch, but like the marvelous Mrs. Maisel is phenomenal. And anyone who hasn't watched it yet, in fact, Jackie, who's a friend of mine and a Chaos Kids Club member, just texted me like yesterday, I think, and she was like, "I started watching Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, and you're right, it's amazing." I'm like, "I told you, like, oh my it's god, so." Great. And okay. that's a kind of a cat. Tits up. It's a catchphrase that they Okay, use well, I will check that out. Amazing. But speaking of, I need to know what is this thing that restaurant workers are freaking out about that mm. you said you were watching? I was a restaurant worker for eight years. So what there's is- this other show. It's an FX show, but you can watch it on Hulu. And the second season just came out recently, I think. And I had not watched the first season, but I was aware of it. I knew what it was and what it was about who the star was. So it's called the bear and the star of the show is, uh, I can never remember his name, but he was, he played lip in shameless, which is a showtime Ah. show. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's the, he's the star of this show. And he is a, like basically a world renowned or at least a a U.S. renowned, like he's a renowned in the show. His character is a renowned chef and he comes back home to Chicago after basically like accolades and the whole nine. Right to uh, take over his brother's uh, sandwich shop that's been in the same spot for however long, forever. It's a like a beloved hole-in-the-wall, you know, Chicago beef sandwich place. And the whole show is just like eerily accurate of what it's like working in kitchens and mm. working in the restaurant business. And it is just like non stop anxiety for anyone who's ever done that work because it is so real and so accurate and it's just so it's good it's a really good show but man my anxiety levels were just high through the whole thing because it's like oh i know i know it i know it's like i know it's like uh Uh, anyway yeah that's what i i did with some of my time this weekend is they're they're like easily digestible bits because most episodes are like half hour episodes and it's it's Mm -hmm. not like an hour long like you know 20 episodes of you know drama it's like you know eight episodes season one it's like 10 episodes season two and they're all almost all of them are like half hour episodes but it's really well written it's really well acted it is super accurate to restaurant life and it's 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 a good show it's a good show okay uh what's going on with you thank you for asking um let's see yesterday i went for my very first time ever into a professional recording studio for oh. a couple of hours. Yeah. Oh. I know. Me too. Was How was really that? Neat. It was nerve wracking. It was neat. Yeah. I've, we've got another session next Monday. Just a lot of pressure too, because trying to get everything done and time is money literally, and it's a lot of money. And so the mess ups were like, Oh my God, I've got to just, you know, I'm psyching myself out. Yeah. It's got to be perfect. You can't do a whole bunch of takes you've got, Uh you know, and so Uh it just, it was a lot. It was fun, but it was a lot. Okay. What are you drinking? Thank you for asking. Um, I'm drinking a Pinot from Willamette Valley called ghost writer. Ghost writer. Yeah. Isn't that fun? Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. yeah, that is fun. Tell me a story. Yes. Sister. Oh, I'm going to tell you a, a bad one. I mean, they're all bad, but this one's really bad. Um, this Great. is the murder of Bianca Devon. Okay. Also, I love the name Bianca. It's a great name. It's the best name. Okay. We a are really going to Utica, New York. Utica? Or Utica. U-T-I-C-H. U-T-I-C-A. C-A. Mm-hmm. Utica, 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 Utica. Your guess is as good as mine. I think it's. There's Utica. no way to know. There's no way to know. <laughs> <laughs> nope. I guess we'll just have to stab in the dark. Okay. <laughs> so police start getting multiple calls about photos circulating on Discord of Bianca Devins, who is a young woman from the area who has a very 
active online presence. And the photos are of her bleeding badly and people are not sure if they are real. So they're calling it in. Oh my God. So the police set out to find 17 year old Bianca Devon to see if she's okay. Okay. Are you on the discord? Is that, I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't spend a lot of time in discord, but like our project has a discord which is, you know, for, uh, and like lots of game projects do, like lots of games do, and it is gamer centric, but it's not just used by gamers. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, but yeah, I mean, this can be like kind of shady, right? Maybe. Well, yeah, it basically, it's a service slash app, right? That is kind of like, I don't know if you've ever used Slack. It's Mm -mm. sort of, it's kind of like a, it's an instant messenger app of sorts, but it's mm-hmm. more robust than your basic instant messenger app. So you can have like, you basically, you have a space. So like for shrapnel, we have like the shrapnel discord and within the shrapnel discord, once you are invited in and accepted as a member of our discord space within that, we have many, 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 many different channels or rooms that you can go and talk in. And there's like the general chat room. And then there's different rooms for like, there's an announcement channel and there's like a, you know, different channels for like different languages, because once we have a certain number of members in the community say that are Spanish speakers, then we have like the Spanish channel for shrapnel members. Right. And it, and we are like, we're not constantly, but we, you know, make new channels depending on what needs we have. So there's like all these different kind of sub communities within the greater shrapnel community and like lots of projects do that. But then like I have a discord handle, I have a personal one somewhere, but I also have one that's tied to like my official shrapnel name. But like once you log into shrapnel, like people then can like anyone can really can create like a a space within discord channels in that space and they can invite whoever they want to like join that space. So people use it for all kinds of things. Mm Hmm. Okay. All right. Thank you for that. I'm not super familiar with it. Now I am. Okay. So that's where these are circulating. They're trying to find her. So Bianca's mom gets a knock at the door and they talk to her. They didn't show mom the photo, but they told her they were afraid that she might be in danger. Okay. So Kim, Bianca's mom said that she had talked to her the day before and that she was heading out to a concert with friends in New York city. All right. She had just graduated high school two weeks earlier And this was her first adult concert without parents. Oh, that's exciting. I remember ours. (laughs) Fleetwood Mac. Well, I don't know if that was my first because I feel like I did go to the Gorge before that with Casey and like a couple other people to see Steve Miller. I think that was before. I think that was before Fleetwood Mac, but Fleetwood Mac was like, I was, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was good stuff. Yeah, that was good stuff. Yeah. So her mom did check on her the night before, but she tried to like give her some space and not, you know. But so. she's still living at home at this time. Yes. Okay. Mm-hmm. Bianca was somebody that struggled with depression quite a bit in high school. And she turned to social media to escape into a different world, which. Sure. Yeah. yeah. I get it. Yeah. She and had also a to very. Like find people like, fi- you know what I mean? Like the one. You know, people, you can say what you will about the internet, like for good or for bad, like one of the upsides to the internet is like finding community Mm -hmm. where maybe you wouldn't normally in your small town or in your, you know, like geographic community, right? Yeah. It concerns me. I mean, oh, I don't, we, I don't need to get on a soapbox, but the concern <laughs> is the idea. And I think Bianca had this a little bit, although she shouldn't have, cause she was amazing, but is that you can strip away your authentic self and be anybody that you wanted to be online. And then you're not really making authentic connections because you're almost a character. If that makes sense. That, I mean, I guess some people do that. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. It, it's just too bad. Um, so she had a very large presence on several platforms. She was considered an e-girl, which an describes e-girl. Like, uh-huh. It's e- with an edgy, dark aesthetic. We're learning the lingo of the kids. Okay. Mm-hmm. okay. At age 16, she was Wait, diagnosed. Wait, is an with- e-girl like an emo girl? Uh, yes. Got it. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Got it. Yeah. 
Yeah. At age 16, she was diagnosed with borderline personality disorder, which greatly affected her mood. And she had two younger sisters, Olivia and Maddie, who were really important to her. So she did seek treatment for her mental health and she had made huge strides like in the last year, year and a half. That's good. Um, Yeah. She was an artist and she had even started modeling and she had turned a corner drastically, but she was still very active on social media with several different personas. Oh, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Like fully like different handles, different, like she was known in different communities as like a totally different person. Yes. Got it. Not totally different, but like, this is my like preppy vibe and this is my edgy vibe and this is Mm -hmm. my, you know, Mm -hmm. yeah. So she had a lot of orbiters, orbiters online, which are male followers. Why am I having to? I haven't even had that much Use wine. your words, Amber. Use your words. Use your words. Uh, words who words, are words. male followers who hover around attractive females online. Females? Did you just say females? I was using, uh, I had to quote, <laughs> I, I had to oh. first Google orbiters and then copy and paste. <laughs> oh, and this is what they would say. They, okay. That makes more sense. Female People who <laughs> hover around other attractive people online. Ah, so, yes. Yes. Mm-hmm. One of these orbiters was 21 year old Lyft driver, Brandon Clark, who she met on Instagram in May of 2019. They eventually met in person and briefly dated, but Bianca wasn't interested in an exclusive relationship. Okay. Kim ha- had met Brandon several times, and she said that he was just like a goofy, dorky guy that she felt good about. Kim did. The mom. hmm No yeah. red flags. Mm-mm. Okay. No. So Brandon Clark was the person who took Bianca to the concert that night. And it was the just online- the two of them? Well, it was supposed to be. Okay. The online followers soon learned that it was also Brandon who made the gory post of Bianca bleeding, and they figured it was just a joke. Mm, okay. Mm-hmm. It's not very uh, funny. No. So another thing that I learned on the interwebs, and you can correct me if this is wrong, is that it's not uncommon for people to post disturbing images on Discord specifically for, like, shock value. Like, there's a lot of that on that platform in particular. Interesting. I mean, I would think it depends on the channel. On the yeah, it depends on the server, like which which space you're in, right? Like for example, like our shrapnel channel or our shrapnel space with all its channels, it's highly moderated. Like we have people we pay and people who volunteer to moderate all of those channels, and you know we remove posts that we find inappropriate and mute people who are being assholes or you know boot mm-hmm. people out who are scammers or whatever, right? Yeah. So like there's it's not like a, just a free for all in there, but some discords are, I think. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, so while police are at Bianca's house with Kim, a call comes into dispatch from Brandon Clark. The officers at Bianca's home can hear the call come in on their earpiece. And the caller says, my name is Brandon Clark. The victim is Bianca Michelle Devins. I'm going to kill myself. So they tell Kim that Brandon has made statements that he may have hurt Bianca and that he is suicidal. And Kim is totally confused about what's going on. Right. She's like, what the fuck are you even talking about? What are you talking about? Yeah. So in the meantime, he posts more photos of Bianca, one with a caption that said, I'm sorry, Bianca. Yeah. (sighs) Okay. So the dispatcher keeps Brandon on the call while police try to ping his location. He refuses to stay on the line, but he tells the dispatcher before he hangs up where he is at. Okay. He's on a dead end road, very close to Bianca's house. And when the officers arrive, Brandon is in his car with a knife. Officers move toward his car with their guns drawn. And then Brandon like starts slashing himself. Oh, for God's sake. Uh Uh-huh. He also takes a photo of that happening and posts it on social media. Like in the middle of slashing himself while the cops are standing there with guns drawn, he's posting to discord. Yeah. This, yeah. yeah. I, ooh, hold this on, guy let me take is a selfie. like, what the fuck? I know. Photo op. Ooh. <laughs> I can't. What? This guy's unhinged. Obviously. Mm hmm. So they are able to apprehend him and get him in an ambulance. He is badly hurt and he's taken to the hospital and like life-saving measures are taken. So back at the dead end road, 
by his vehicle, officers discovered the deceased body of a young woman under a tarp, and it was Bianca. But before officers are able to get back to Bianca's house and tell her mom, someone texted Bianca's sister the photo. What? Which photo? One of the many photos of Bianca injured. From the Discord. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. I I know. But, yeah. Fuck. Yeah. Okay. Fucking horrific. So investigators start going over the crime scene, and there is a message in spray paint black spray paint in the road with, and it says, may you never forget me. And apparently this phrase was taken from a series of Japanese comic books called pun pun. Okay. Which is like a dark sort of, um, anime anime. Yeah. Clark and Bianca were both super into them. They're dark and violent. And there's also music playing at the crime scene playing over a Bluetooth speaker with Brandon's cell phone. The song was test drive by Joji. And it was playing on repeat. And it was a song about a person who was more invested in the relationship than the other person. Okay, Brandon. So fucking weird. So investigators also combed through Brandon and Bianca's social media. And they learned that Bianca had invited a new friend named Alex to join them at the concert that night. And yeah. Brandon did not like that. Nope. 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 They talked to Alex and he says that Brandon really seemed like he was angry that he was there. There was a text from Bianca to Alex that said, quote, I think he saw me kiss you. So on the way back to Unica from New York City, Brandon posted a photo of the highway with a caption that says, here comes hell. It's redemption, right? What? Oh, Jesus. Fucking uh, rejected Mm -hmm. young men in there. Oh, we'll get to that. We'll Mm -hmm. get to that. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so when they do a thorough analysis of brandon's phone they find a video of the murder he videotaped himself murdering her yep yeah bianca appears to be sleeping on the back seat which is folded down he clips his cell phone to a vent clip in the car gets i'm not going to go into a lot of detail and they didn't either in this thing that i was watching but he gets a knife out of his bag and then he wakes bianca up and has a conversation with her he asks her about the kiss she had with alex and he tells her you know that i saw that and she said i know i'm sorry and he said sorry wasn't good enough she tells him we're not in an exclusive relationship and can you please take me home now and then that's when brandon started stabbing her what a piece of shit Mm -hmm. When he's done, he screams into the camera and he says, Bianca, why did you make me do this? Oh my God, no. Fuck right the fuck off. Mm -hmm. Oh, that makes me so fucking mad. This guy's a piece of fucking shit. He's a monster. Well, remember that story of the fucking high school kid who stabbed the girl that he asked to like prom or homecoming or whatever and she said no? Like, Mm -hmm. yeah, Yeah. this is, this Mm -hmm. is. This is, I, yep. Yeah. Yeah. Ugh. I'm so fucking mad. I am so fucking mad. Mm-hmm. So afterwards, he took the photos and posted them online. Investigators also learned that Brandon planned on killing Bianca long before the concert because in the notes app on his phone, he had a to-do list of what he needed to do to carry out this plan that included setting up speakers. And then it said last song question mark. He, I, this guy, I, 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 I can't, he, ha- Oh, keep yeah. going. They believe that this all started when Bianca made the decision to not be in an exclusive relationship with him. Obviously. Yeah, of course. Mm-hmm. Of course. Yeah. So Brandon does make a recovery and he is charged with murder. He Good. enters a plea of not guilty. Seriously. <laughs> oh, I'm, uh, okay. Whatever. Uh-huh. Meanwhile, the photos of Bianca continue to be circulated online and Bianca's oh, family no. is being harassed. People are sending it to them. Why? What? Hara- just, just online trolls. Oh, it's on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter and discord. And, uh, her mom, Kim pleaded with all of these companies to get the photos off and they stayed on for a few weeks before it was taken down and then someone would put them up again and she'd have to start over again. What the fuck? 
That's why it's like all these place. I mean, I know like you guys for your channel or whatever, but that was going to be my next question about like moderators. It's like all these companies are supposed to have moderators, but are they really? I mean, I don't know that Discord does any moderation at all on its end. It's not like Facebook where they have like literal teams of moderators who, you know, you know, I don't, I I don't know. I can't actually speak for that. I don't know yeah. for sure. Well, I've been like locked out of Instagram before for putting up things like, um, I think when I put up the petition for the American Bar Association to sign the petition to get rid of the gay trans panic defense, what? Instagram like blocked me out for a while and said I had like unapproved content or whatever. This was, oh Yeah. Well, I mean, that's like the complaint on Facebook all the time, Amber, about how like you can't go talking about white people or men without getting like, you know, suspended or at least your wrist slapped. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But but then then, this girl is dead and her mom and people are posting pictures of her like in various states of dying with blood everywhere. Mm -hmm. And like, that's fine. Uh huh. Yeah. What? Yeah. So yeah, people are sending the photos to Bianca's family members through direct message with comments like she deserved it. What? Oh my God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So behavioral scientist, Stephen Coronado believes that these individuals responding to these photos are incels. Obviously. I'm just going to... I also have another Google Def. I know it, but other people maybe don't, which is short for involuntary celibate. Mm -hmm. Exactly what we were just talking about. They're men 21 or older who have gone six months or longer without sexual activity and not by their own choice. Incels see themselves as victims. According to Dr. Coronado, there have been more than 50 mass shootings in the U.S. attributed to incel ideology. Yep. We talked about this, I don't know how many episodes ago it was. Remember I told you about the massacre in uh, college in Canada? Mm -hmm. That was the guy went into the classroom and separated the room, like men on one side, women on the other, let all the Mm -hmm. men go, and then gunned down all the women. It's so fucking gross. What's his name? The Santa Barbara fucking loser who went on that shooting rampage and had his manifesto online and shit. I... Yeah. yeah. Well, and then it, there was the it, one that it's like epidemic. it's fucking was epidemic. Like doing Facebook Live while he was doing his mass shooting. Yeah. There's yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So Bianca has several other friends online, much like her friends that have orbiters, and they're mm-hmm. all just like freaking the fuck out for their own well, safety. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. In February of 2020, before the case goes to trial, Brandon Clark changes his plea to guilty. But then just before sentencing, he changes his mind again and says that he wants to go to trial. Mm -hmm. This, I, okay. Yeah. This poor family. Seriously. Uh, He said that he was pressured by his attorney to enter a guilty plea. So they have a whole hearing about this. And his attorney testifies. He says that it was untrue. He said he actually encouraged Clark to plead not guilty and to go to trial, but that he refused. So the judge denies Clark's request to withdraw his guilty plea. Well, so, like, like nope, dude, what are you guilty. even doing? Because if you go, if you take a plea deal, they usually give you some kind of reduction in the severity of your sentencing. And if you go to trial, you run the risk of getting like the fucking book thrown at you. And Mm -hmm. there is a video of you committing the murder. Yeah. They have all the evidence. Yeah. First he tried to say too, that he was taking a plea because he didn't want to subject her family to the photos and videos. Yeah. Okay. Whatever. Mr. Fuck off. Fucking online the whole entire time. Like uh, whatever. What what they've already seen it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. So the judge is like, no, sorry, you're guilty. Um, so he's, um, (laughs) he's sentenced to the maximum. 25 years to life. He will be eligible for parole in his late forties, which is still like pretty young. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Bianca's family is working with local politicians to get Bianca's law passed, which would hold social media companies accountable for graphic and violent content that they allow on their platform. They have also established uh a scholarship in Bianca's name for students who have ambitions to help young people with mental health struggles. (sighs) Yeah. Yeah. And that is the online fucking murder of Bianca Devin. That is awful. So awful. 
Like incels are a fucking plague. And also just side note, PS, do you know, it was a woman who actually coined the phrase incel. It was like the late nineties and it was not like, it's been co-opted since then Mm -hmm. by the manosphere. Mm. And what's that? Late nineties. Mm-hmm. I think it was the late nineties, early two thousands. Yeah. It was a woman. She like wrote about it in like a blog post or something. And somehow it's been co-opted by the manosphere. And I, <laughs> it's really problematic. Yeah. Yeah, it is. I mean, yeah, it there. I don't even have words. It's just so fucking gross. It's so fucking gross. What a fucking Women are the emotional ones though. Right. Uh, you don't see women going on a goddamn rampage because somebody didn't want to date us. Right? Yeah. I, I really, I mean, maybe that happened one time, but I don't know about it. I've never heard about it. I've never mm-hmm. heard of a mass shooting or a rampage killing of any kind by a woman because she was rejected. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, sister. I... <sighs> <sighs> I know. I'm sorry. It's fine. It's Young fine. men. Gonna, you know what? I, I could talk about this shit all day because there's just know. so much. There's so much out there. There's so much out there. And you know, like I spend time sometimes, I don't do the TikTok, but a lot of TikTok content ends up on other platforms. And so like I do end up scrolling through a lot of videos, a lot of which come from TikTok or they're TikTok like because TikTok has, you know, so informed like short form video content. Right. And so I do a lot of scrolling And I see a lot of content out there and a lot of different types of content, but there is just a shit ton of shitty fucking takes on men and women and dating and Mm. sex. And it is concerning how much like shit content there is out there being served up as like you know, advice as, as expert opinions, as, you know, like authorities on, you know, X, Y, and Z. And, um, Mm -hmm. these, especially young men are so susceptible to this fucking nonsense. And I just, but again, like it's that thing where, you know, like we, I'm at this place now where it feels like every single episode, I'm like, how is the solution to this murder though. Like, I know. How is that your answer, you know, to any problem? I don't understand. I will mm-hmm. never understand it. I will. Yeah. Divorce is always an option. Also piggybacking <laughs> right? on what you just said, I, cause I had this moment today and I thought of you and I was like, Oh fuck Amber. So I was scrolling through reels on Facebook, uh-huh. which I sometimes do I on, my, about. Yep, on yep. my break. Cause it's like, whatever. And I stopped on one and it was this woman talking about relationships, you know? Uh And I was like, I don't even remember what she said, but I was like, wow, that actually was really profound and insightful. Like, okay. And then I didn't even look at the name. When I look at it, it's that teal lady. (gasps) Teal swan? Yeah. And I was like, no. (laughs) (laughs) Nope. And then you're like, nope, disregard, disregard. Never mind. Never mind. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Evacuate from my brain. No, no. (laughs) You know, mm-hmm. I see all kinds of shit like that, that people don't realize, like every once in a while, I, like there's been this time where like I'm scrolling through and somebody like posts like an inspirational quote. Right. Mm-hmm. And it sounds really, it sounds really good. And then I look at it and it's attributed to Osho. Oh no. You know who Osho is, right? I don't know who's the originator behind it. I've seen some other shit from Osho that's like, Okay, Osho is the guy, is the name that that guy went by eventually who created the uh, Rajneeshi cult down in California, Oregon, 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 the one that they did that starter on called Wild Wild Country. Yes. Yes. That's Osho. (laughs) Oh, no. And his little, like these little inspirational quotes are like little, you know, picture people post on their Facebook page to like, right. It's like, they're, they're all over the place. It's crazy. Uh Do you know though who you're, who you're sharing right now? Yeah. Do you know what you're circulating? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that shit is, it's like, yes, exactly. All of that. All of that. Mm -hmm. Oh, sister. Um, let's just do like a chaos. How's that? Okay. That sounds better. 
Okay. 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 I'm going to tell you about Valentino's cursed ring. Have you ever heard about this? No. Okay. So I'm going to try and say this, but I am not Italian and I do not speak Italian. So please forgive me if I just completely bungle this. And it is quite a mouthful of a name. Rodolfo Pietro Filiberto Raffaello Guglielmi di Valentina D'Antanguola. Nailed it. That's his full name. He was known oh. professionally as Rudolph Valentino. You've That's heard easier. Of Valentino, right? You've heard no. that name? You've never heard of <laughs> Rudolph Valentino? Okay. So, Rudolph Valentino. He was born May 6th, 1895 in Italy. His father was a captain of cavalry in the Italian army and then later became a veterinarian who died of malaria when Rudolph was 11. Mm -hmm. Rudolph's mom was French and was a lady in waiting to a Marquess, which I think means she was some kind of personal servant to the wife of a Marquis. I think okay. a Marquess is the wife of a Marquis and I think a lady in waiting is somebody who like dresses her and does her hair and oh sounded right? so much fancier right she was waiting for something good to happen no no no, no. <laughs> no, no. she's waiting to <laughs> tend to the needs of the marquess okay. um rudolph had an older brother a younger sister and then he also had an older sister who had died as a baby oh. when he was a kid rudolph was indulged because of his exceptional looks and his playful personality. Hmm. He wasn't a very good student, and he eventually got placed into an agricultural school where he did get some kind of certification. At the age of 18, unable to find employment in Italy, he left for America to make a life for himself. Mm -hmm. He was processed at Ellis Island on December 23rd, 1913. He worked odd jobs like gardening and bussing tables, but he got fired because he wasn't very good at any of it. And I really get the <laughs> sense that he was like such a good looking kid and so outgoing and fun that he never had to really like get good at anything. Uh-huh. You yeah. know, like he kind of just know. charmed his way through everything. I've known a few of those. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. we all. Mm -hmm. so, he, he would get hired to dance at like a, like a dinner theater type place, right? So mm -hmm. during this time, he befriends a Chilean heiress who was in an unhappy marriage. I guess there's like this whole kind of group of expat European moneyed people who are just kind of like living like bohemians or something in this, you know, like <laughs> America, right? Mm -hmm. So she files for divorce and she claims that her husband was cheating on her and Rudolph testified as a witness to this. So afterwards, her ex-husband got Rudolph arrested along with a well-known madam on some unspecified vice charge. What? Yeah. But what happened was it was highly publicized and Rudolph struggled to find any employment after that. I mean, he was connected to this scandalous divorce, got charged with, I don't know what the vice charge was, something around prostitution or something, maybe whatever. And now, hmm. you know, so now he's, his name's out there, but not in a good way. So then that heiress gets into a fight with her ex-husband over custody issues and she shot him dead. She shot her ex-husband? Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. So... Rudolph skips town, so he doesn't get called as a witness. Like, in any of that yeah, <laughs> he's like uh, too far, too far. Gotta go. <laughs> mm -hmm. So he joined a traveling musical group that took him to the West Coast. He did a couple of stage shows. Sometime around 1917, he made a friend while he was in San Francisco. This actor named Norman Carey, who was all dude. Movies is where it's at. So the two of them moved into a place together in L.A. And while Rudolph was working on getting into films, and to be clear, this is still very much the era of silent film, he's oh. dancing, he's teaching dance, and he's building up a clientele of, like, older rich mm -hmm. ladies who regularly, like, let him borrow their luxury cars and stuff. So he is clearly, like, just milking this good looks and charm that he's got going on. Uh -huh. And now he's... Uh -huh dance instructor. It's all very, you know, like Johnny at the, 
at the resort. I, that's exactly <laughs> what I thought of. Right? Uh-huh. Old lady yeah, stuff yeah, and yeah. diamonds in my pocket. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Totally. <laughs> mm-hmm. So eventually he gets pretty successful with this dance career and he can afford his own place. And he's really trying to get into movies. So he gets small parts, mostly as a villain or a gangster. Because at this time, the leading man was like fair skinned, light eyes, light hair, that very like dream Aryan kind of look that, you know, yeah. Hitler would approve. Um, <laughs> And it all comes back to the Nazis. It always comes back to the Nazis. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and Rudolph, of course, he's olive skinned, dark eyes, dark hair. So he did get to leading man status a couple years later. He starred in The Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, which was released in 1921. And it was a huge success. It was one of the first films to make a million dollars at the box office and is the sixth highest grossing silent film ever. Shit. Wow. Okay. During this period, he also got married, but it was rumored that the marriage was never consummated. Oh. Right. Okay. So... He was in a couple other films that didn't do as well as the apocalypse. And then he played the leading man in a film called The Sheik. This film was a major success and would be the defining film, not only of his career, but of his image and his legacy. This is the film that really solidified Rudolph Valentino as a movie star hunk. Okay. Yeah. Is it still silent films? Yes. Still silent. Mm Mm-hmm. In 1922, he married his second wife, Natasha Rambova. But this is weird because he hadn't been divorced for a full year from his first wife as required by law in California at that time. He was put on trial for bigamy. Whoa. Yeah. And of course, this was a big news story, right? I mean, he's now this big time Hollywood star who's on trial for bigamy, which is like scandalous. Right. Uh Sure. So the result was an annulment of his marriage to Natasha and they had to wait a year to get married. Okay. They like live separately and the whole thing. So then he got into a big fight, which turned into a lawsuit with one of the studios over his compensation and the fact that none of his films were shot in Spain or anywhere in Europe as he had been told that they would be. And he mm-hmm. hadn't seen his family in a decade. So he was kind of counting on some of these movies being shot in Europe so that he could like visit his family. Yeah. And this studio came for him in return. They were like, Oh, Sue, you want to sue us? We'll sue you. So he wrote an open letter that was published in the paper But the average American did not sympathize with this Hollywood diva, right? Because they're Mm -hmm. he's quibbling over like how much he's getting paid, but his salary at that time as a you know under contract with the studio was already more than the average American made in a year. Wow. And um and the studio said they had offered him fair compensation and now he was more trouble than he was worth. Okay, so this is back in the time when actors worked for one studio by contract. So you would get signed on by a studio and you only made movies for them. Yikes. Can you imagine that now? No, I'm actually pretty sure I was talking with Aiden, you know, our friend who is the partner of one of my fellow co-founders and she works in the film industry. And we were having this conversation about the SAG strike and the writer's Mm -hmm. strike. And she was the one that said, I'm pretty sure she wasn't a hundred percent, but she was like 99% sure that the last time that SAG, the actors went on strike, it was to end this practice. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. So now it's a stalemate because Rudolph will not work for that studio and they exercised their right to extend his contract, making it illegal for him to work anywhere else even though other studios were making offers. I mean, at the time, this guy was like a hot commodity. People wanted uh-huh. to make him. Fuck, that's frustrating. 
So Rudolph could make money other ways, but as long as he wasn't making films. So he got a new agent who got him and his wife a touring gig performing around the country as spokespeople for this beauty product company. And it was hugely successful. Yeah, they did like this like whirlwind, like year long or more tour. They went to like 80 or 90 different cities. They even went up into Canada a couple times. There were like beauty pageants and he judged them and they would do these touring shows where they would like sing and dance and and it was all basically as spokespeople for this beauty company. They made a bunch of money and people fucking loved it. Well, he and the studio eventually made nice and they made a new deal and Rudolph was good with it. So he fulfilled his contract with that studio and then he made new deals for more films. His wife, Natasha, was controversial and accused of being too distracting on set and was basically barred from his shoots. She had a career of her own in film as like, I don't know, like behind the scenes in different ways. And she was trying to like kind of get her hands in there and, you know, influence decisions and things like that. And, you know, she was like uh, the original, like, you know, what some would call Yoko Ono of her time. Right. Like she was Uh getting in the way of Rudolph's career. Mm -hmm. So this put a strain on their marriage, right? And the two eventually did divorce. This was like 1925 or 1926. So they were married like three or four years. Mm -hmm. Throughout all of this, Rudolph struggled with his public perception. The women of America were basically just wet for Valentino. He was the epitome of romance. He was dashing and dark and handsome. American Mm -hmm. men, on the other hand, they were not huge fans. He was considered too effeminate, not manly, right? Is is that what the problem was or were they threatened because all of the women wanted him? I mean, yes, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. I mean, the problem is both, right? Yeah. Fucking incels from the 1920s. (laughs) (laughs) Well, you know, men have had, you know, whatever. So Rudolph Mm -hmm. hated this. He even challenged a reporter to a boxing match for questioning his manliness. Whoa. Like, okay, put your dukes up. That reporter didn't take him up on it, but another reporter did. And Rudolph Mm -hmm. kicked his ass. (laughs) I mean, I'm usually not like rooting for that kind of thing, but... It kind of feels good, right? (laughs) Yeah, it really does. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He also published a book of poetry as well as multiple serialized essays for various publications, all of which were later published as books after his death. So for many years after his death, speculation circulated that Rudolph was actually gay, but no evidence existed to confirm this. And it was widely accepted today that he was straight. He was just not manly looking. Mm Mm-hmm. As to his death, on August 15th, 1926, Rudolph collapsed at the Hotel Ambassador in Manhattan and was rushed to the hospital. He was diagnosed with appendicitis and gastric ulcers requiring emergent surgery. Post-surgery, he developed peritonitis, which is an inflammation of the lining of the inner wall of the abdomen. On the 18th, the doctor said his prognosis was good, but his condition worsened on the 21st, and he developed pleuritis, which is also inflammation, but this time around the lining of his lungs. Oh. Doctors knew he would die, but did not tell Rudolph this, and he did die on August 23rd, 1926, at the age of 31. It was later confirmed that his cause of death was sepsis. Oh, no. That's awful. 31. God. I know, like really young, right? And 100,000 people lined the streets of Manhattan to pay their respects at his funeral. No. Some fans reportedly died by suicide from the grief. And an all-day riot ensued on August 24th. Jeez. But here's where we're actually going to get chaotic. Not long before his collapse at that hotel in New York, Rudolph had been in San Francisco. Well, no, it was actually a couple years before that. Rudolph had been in San Francisco where he bought a silver ring with a tiger's eye setting from a shopkeeper who told him he did not want to sell that ring to Rudolph because it was cursed. He claimed that terrible things had happened to the ring's previous owners. What? Right. Rudolph would not hear it. and He wanted that ring. So he bought it for a very hefty sum. Oh, shit. Rudolph supposedly wore the ring every day of filming his next movie after that, which was called the young Raja and was reportedly his first critical and commercial flop. Apparently he stopped wearing the ring for a while after that, 
But he decided to start wearing it again for the premiere of his film, Son of Sheik, which was a sequel to The Sheik and would be his final film. Okay. He continued wearing the ring the next few weeks after the premiere. And it was then that he collapsed at that hotel and ultimately died from what many say was a mixed diagnosis. Holy shit. The ring then passed to his lover at the time, Pola Negri who was an actor as well, a very famous one, a very beautiful one with her own successful movie career. She had been given the choice of any item she wanted from Rudolph's belongings, and she chose the ring, thinking it's very important to Rudolph. That's what I want. Very shortly after she got this ring, she became gravely ill, and once she recovered, her career was just over. Oh, no. She was worried Rudolph's ring might actually be cursed, so she gifted it to singer Russ Columbo. Some said Columbo (laughs) looked just like Rudolph, and she said the ring was, quote, from one Valentino to another. She suspected it was cursed and gifted it to someone? That's right. Kind of rude. (laughs) Only a few days after receiving the ring, Russ Columbo was visiting his friend Lansing Brown, and they were examining various pieces in Lansing Brown's collection gun collection. And Brown says, quote, I was absentmindedly fooling around with one of the guns. It was of a dueling design and works with a cap and trigger. I was pulling back the trigger and clicking it time after time. I had a match in my hand. And when I clicked, apparently the match caught in between the hammer and the firing pin. There was an explosion. Russ slid to the side of his chair. So what happened was the ball that shot out of the gun ricocheted off a nearby table and hit Russ above the left eye. Surgeons at Good Samaritan Hospital made an unsuccessful attempt to remove the ball from Russ's brain. He died less than six hours after the shooting. His death was ruled an accident and Lansing Brown was exonerated from blame. Oh my God. Russ's good friend, Joe Casino, inherited all of Russ's stuff, I think. That's how it's described, which included Rudolph Valentino's cursed ring. At this point, the cursed ring had a bad rep. So Joe, yeah, yeah. yeah, (laughs) Like this word was getting around. So Mm -hmm. Joe kept the ring under glass and did not touch it or wear it for a few years. But eventually he must have decided it was silly and he started wearing the ring. Mm Mm-hmm. A couple weeks after he put that ring on, he was in a fatal car crash when a truck struck his vehicle, T-boned him, died in the crash. Oh my God. Right? Fuck. So now the ring moves to a new owner, Joe's brother, Del Casino. Del is not superstitious. He thinks all of it is nonsense. And he now has this infamous ring that belonged to the Rudolph Valentino. He puts that ring on display in his home. And then one night, a man named James Willis breaks into Dell's home to rob it. But he tripped an alarm and the police arrived and end up shooting this man, Willis, dead at the scene. In the pocket of his jacket was Rudolph's tiger's eye ring. No. Yes. Oh my God. How many, what's the death toll now? What's the ring death toll? Six? The ring death toll is three or four, because Pola didn't die, Oh, but Russ did, and then Joe did, and now this James guy did. Okay, so anyway. Anyway, fuck. So Dell's no idiot. He's not taking any more chances. He locks that fucker up in a safe in his house after that. Until 1928, when an unknown actor trying to break into the business wants to audition for the role of Rudolph Valentino in a biopic of Rudolph's life. It's unclear if this actor, Jack Dunn, or the director, Edward Small, asked Dell to borrow the ring and some of Rudolph's clothing. But either way... Jack Dunn wears that ring for screen tests, and two weeks later, he died. No! A a rare blood-borne disease called tularemia, which he picked up from handling a dead rabbit on a hunting trip? What? Yes. So the rings returned to Dell, and he kept that fucker locked away and hidden until his death from natural causes. All of his possessions, including the supposedly cursed ring, were transferred to a bank vault in LA owned by Dell. The bank was robbed twice. One of those times thieves took the ring and were shot dead while trying to make their getaway. 
The bank also experienced a fire, and at this point, no one is entirely sure where the ring is, whether it's still in that vault or has been lost or stolen by someone else. Some think it disappeared in the fire at the bank, and some think it might still be in the vault. But we don't really know where this ring is now. Oh, my God. But that is the story of Rudolph Valentino's cursed ring. Holy shit. If someone offered you that ring, would you take it? What's that? (laughs) Would you take the ring if someone offered it to you? I ha- I mean, probably not, but I'd want somebody else to take it and just see what happens. <laughs> God. <laughs> Who's the somebody else? I don't what? know. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not choosing someone. I'm that not- is wild. Right? Uh-huh. Oh, my God. I have never heard of that. Where did you find that? I don't remember the first time I heard about it. It's been on my list for a while. Wow. That I, was a good I stumbled, one, sis. I stumbled, thank you. I stumbled across it somewhere, somehow, uh, quite some time ago, and it's just been sitting on my list. So uh, there you go. There you go. That was no. that was chaos of the day. That was chaos. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Mm-hmm. You're so welcome. Um, oh. Well, Sissy, we did it. First one down. First one down. Mm-hmm. Time for a refill and a like, regroup. Do you have a <laughs> bathroom break and a... <laughs> Yeah, mm-hmm. refill on the bevies and, oh, do you have anything for the good of the order? Oh, you know what I want to say? I want to say, you guys, uh, I'm going to say this. We have bonus content. We put out a, a, like an entire episode every month that is behind a paywall just so that you can be a part of the club with us. So we have a Patreon. It is patreon.com backslash crime, wine, and chaos. It is $5 a month. We don't have any other tiers. We are very like equity based over here at crime one and chaos. And we give you bonus content there. And if we get somewhere between three and five more chaos kids in the club, we'll be able to have another virtual wine night and get on the zoomy zoom and laugh <laughs> and chat and talk about whatever. So, um, I, we'd love it. We would love it if you would come and hang out with us. So go do that. We um, certainly would. We would also love a review. Oh, if please. you listen on Apple, that's the preferred. It give is. us a review. Give us a rating. Yeah. Yeah. We um, love that. We love that. We do love that. Follow we're us on, on all the, the socials. Things. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, you guys know, I mean, we're not going to waste your time with all of it. You, you know, crime one and chaos, go find us. We're everywhere. Uh, we're well, sister, that was fucking chaotic. Fucking chaotic. chaotic. Bye. Love you. Bye. Love you. Bye. show, you can visit our Patreon page at crime, wine, and chaos forward slash Patreon. Cheers. Sissy, yeah. I can only see like half your face. Well, <laughs> I can see all of my face in my window of me. Oh, weird. Well, whatever squad cast.